Spadiz is not new to any of you, but uh, it is a plant that probably occupies an ideal niche here in the Flint Hills. Um, it grows at a time when there's normally, or sorry, it reproduces at a time when there's no normally little to no grazing pressure. It's a plant that's high in condensed tannins. Uh, beef cattle are particularly sensitive to that uh, mild toxin. Uh, so even when grazing pressure is present on the Flint Hills, generally there's, there's little uh, grazing pressure put on the plant. It is a, a highly adaptive plant in terms of growth form. Uh, it gets big and wolfy and can shade out other species. It's also allelopathic, uh, which means that it outcompetes uh, other plants for uh, occupying uh, canopy space in the tall grass prairie. Uh, I, I really believe the, the key to controlling Cerisi lespediza is getting a hold of it or getting ahead of it rather reproductively. Um, we've all heard horror stories about the durability of Cerisia seed in the soil bank and how many seeds literally that one Cerisia plant can produce in a year. Um, if we can break that cycle of reproduction, prevent it from being so prolific, I think we can not eradicate it, but we can probably naturalize it here. It's not unbeatable. We just need to find the, the correct chinks in its armor to go to work. Now, up till now, we've used herbicide pretty much exclusively as our control method, and we know that uh, it's not something that we can, we can do infrequently or do once and, and uh, solve the problem. First of all, herbicides are not completely desirable from the standpoint that they're not species specific. They don't care if they hit a good plant or a bad plant they're going to kill. Okay, and that's why we use spot spring as opposed to broadcast spring and the, the time factor involved in spot spring and in, in finding, visualizing plants and getting chemical on them is uh, defeating, I guess, uh, from personal experience. Eradication obviously hasn't uh, been feasible over the last 25 or 30 years. So it's a repeating cost. We're going to do it annually or maybe uh, every other or every third year. Um, probably the reason or one of the main reasons that herbicides have been um, just a stalemate sort of a tool is that aerial application doesn't reach understory plants. We're simply as, as herbicide applicator is not going to see all the plants that are out there, particularly the juveniles that are in the understory. The herbicide just never reaches them and kills them. Now, under normal circumstances, the way that ecology works, plants are kept in check in a plant community through differential grazing pressure. Um, unfortunately, beef cattle do not like Cerisia lespediza because of its condensed tannin content. And according to our research, beef cattle are much more sensitive to condensed tannins than small ruminants are. Uh, in another study we're running, um, sheep do a marvelous job at grazing Cerisia lespediza and keeping it from producing seed. But there are, let's face it, we live in beef cattle country and there are cultural barriers that uh, are going to keep it beef cattle country here. Um, now another thing that works against us from the standpoint of control is that by my calculations, about 70% of the AUMs in the Flint Hills are occupied by yearling cattle, and they are simply not here at a time in the Cerisia lespediza growth cycle when it's vulnerable to damage. And that interval is generally as the plant begins to flower, that starts sometime in, in uh, late August or early September, and continues on through seed set. And for a lot of the Flint Hills, we simply don't have any grazing pressure during that interval. Okay, dramatic pause, and okay, we're moving on to the trial. I'm giving you today a report of the first two years of a four-year study. We're about halfway through the third year, and things look very similar this year compared to the first two. Uh, we have a site in Geary County that's it's fairly small, but it's got a massive Cerisia problem. Um, the initial canopy frequency of Cerisia lespediza on the site was 36%. So 36% of one square foot plots contained at least one Cerisia plant. 
Uh, we have on this site uh, nine replicated units that we've delineated via mowing, and each unit has a 100-yard transect in it. That 100-yard transect has 100 measurement points, basically. Uh, early on in our trial, yearling cattle or cows were grazed during the winter and spring, and that's not been true this, this last year. And that's made for more difficult burning conditions. Uh, it turns out that we, we actually need to have cattle uh, in the area immediately prior to burning to create uh, a duff layer to carry the fire. On this site, okay, we have nine units if you recall and they're assigned randomly to one of three burn times. Okay, mid-spring, which would be the typical dormant season burn in early April. Mid-summer, which is conducted right about August 1st or late summer, which is conducted right about September 1st. Now these, these transects are gonna be read actually at uh, one of four times, but two of them are particularly critical. Our, our transects are read in mid-July before either of our growing season burns are applied. And then in mid-October, after regrowth has, uh, has occurred and plants are approaching senescence, uh, we also collect individual Cerecia plants uh, right at first frost to measure seed production. Okay, this is just a, a picture of our site. Um, Humboldt Creek Road here down in the southwest corner. Native range wraps around it from the west and the north, and then there's a crop field along the southeast quadrant. Okay, each one of these little plots that you see here is color-coded as to treatment. So why during the growing season? Okay, we're using prescribed fire as a potential Cerecia control method because late blooming plants are, are more affected by, per, by growing season prescribed burns than by dormant season burns. Um, we've also learned from our colleagues at Oklahoma that dormant season spring fires, when we normally do it, probably stimulate Cerecia lespidesi growth because those seeds that were cast the previous fall are lying on or near the soil surface and that fire provides just enough heat to scarify that seed coat and allow the plant to germinate. Other research at Oklahoma State indicated that on patch burn systems where fire was applied every third year, that the rate of Cerecia infestation or invasion rather slowed. And that was enough information for us to go to work and consider a growing season fire as a Cerecia control method. Now one of the, the whys that we've added subsequent to beginning the study is that we've discovered that fire safety and fire control are much easier to manage during the growing season compared to the dormant season. Uh, it's a smoky fire but it's very slow moving. Okay, the key measurements that we're collecting on our study Soil cover and plant species composition over the four years of treatment. We're not in a position to present that data yet, except in very preliminary sense. Uh, we look at forage biomass pre and post treatment to see what regrowth is like following those growing season burns. Uh, we look at basal and canopy frequency of Cerecia lespidiza and also measurements of vigor, like seed production, maximum stem height, uh, canop or sorry, crown maturity, and things of that nature. So this is day one, year one. This is the first growing season fire that I or anybody on my crew managed. And it didn't seem logical that green grass would burn, but burn it did. That's the same area just a few seconds after I walked by it with the drip torch. Again, this growing season fire is very slow moving and it's very smoky. Uh, most of the additional smoke that results is, is uh, from water vapor being uh, liberated from those green plants and uh, released into the atmosphere. Now you'll see that there's a lot of standing material uh, in the path where the fire has immediately passed. What carries this growing season fire is the duff layer that's just a few inches above the soil surface. It's not the standing vegetation itself. And just after we conducted our, our first set of growing season burns back in 2014, Google Earth did their overflight and uh, took a picture of it. You can see that from a 10,000 foot view, that fire carried very, very well. Now this is what we're all used to seeing uh, following a, a dormant season burn. The path of the burn is slick and stark. It looks just like a skillet. Everything is disappeared. Okay, by contrast, a growing season burn is much more ragged in its appearance. 
In the left panel, you see a, a burn that was conducted about August 1st. In the right hand panel, a burn that was conducted about September 1st. Now, one of the reasons that I like uh, a burn that's closer to September 1st as opposed to a burn that's closer to July 1st is the, uh, the degree to which the fire carries. It seems to be much more complete as we approach September 1st than uh, on August 1st. Okay, a little bit of data for you. One of the things that we need to be able to assure our ranchers of it is, is if they burn during the growing season, are they still going to be able to have a fall or winter grazing opportunity on that, uh, on that ground that's been burned? Okay, on July 16th, before each of our growing season burns have been applied, uh, all treatments have been equal across th two years of the study at about 4,500 pounds of biomass, average date of July 16th. Now, the, the patches that are burned in the spring – Okay, they don't have any fire pressure, obviously no grazing pressure during that interval. They just sit there and they grow. And biomass very nearly triples okay, on those, uh, those spring burn patches. Okay, during this interval between July 16th and October 9th, we have our two, um, our two growing season fires. And you can see that uh, those patches that are burned on or near August 1st, pictured here in the purple bar, they recover uh, their original biomass by that point. So they've got um, just about six weeks to regrow post-fire. Now pictured here in the white is our uh, September 1 burn, okay, and it only has, uh, it only has about a month to recover, and it also uh, achieves its, its pre-fire uh, biomass level going into those winter months. Okay, averaged over two years of the study, one which was a very dry year and one which was fairly wet, uh, we, have, we have achieved residual biomass levels that are greater than 3,400 pounds per acre. That's comparable to what you leave behind after an episode of intensive early stocking. Okay, just to give you a feel for how rapidly that that regrowth occurs, in the left-hand panel in this shot is a patch that was burned for our September 1st treatment. And this is five days, just a bit of green fuzz that's starting to poke up through that black duff. Now, 20 days post-fire. In the right-hand panel, there's quite a lot more green fuzz here. Okay, that four inch in the picture is probably about four inches high at that point. Again, 20 days worth of regrowth. And again, this was pictured, both of these pictures were taken in the dry year of our study. Okay, this is that same patch taken, uh, photographs taken uh, 27 days post-burn. Okay, you can see in the left-hand panel that we've got a lot of forage that has, uh, that has replaced itself in that short interval of time post-burn. Okay, in the right panel, you can see that Cerisia lespidiza vegetatively comes roaring back. Okay, but the point of, of this is that uh, these plants in the right-hand panel, these Cerisia plants, are only a month to six weeks away from a killing frost. They have no time to reproduce themselves under this scenario. Okay, and the, the passage of the fire has, has weakened the plant vegetatively. It was top killed and then it regrew and there's simply no life cycle time left for that plant to make significant seed. Now one of our key metrics here is if we apply growing season burns in series, okay, we've, we've got two in a series of four so far, um, will that weaken the plant's physical presence? Will, will the vegetative portion of the plant start to decrease? Okay, and the answer is yes to a degree. Okay, looking at our July 16th date here, again, averaged over two years. Okay, we started this trial with an even 36% canopy frequency across all three treatments. Okay, after two years of burning, canopy frequency of Cerisia on our conventional spring burn has increased to about 45% pretreatment. Okay, that's in the gray bar. Still on July 16th. Okay, we've got, we're starting to see a trend toward decrease in our August 1st burn, and we've got a, a statistically significant decrease 
in our late summer burns. And basically that's about a, a one third decrease in canopy frequency comparing a conventional spring burn with a late summer burn conducted on August 1st. Now, if we look at the end of the season after our fires have been applied, okay, we see the effect even more pronounced. Okay, no change from July 16th to October 9th in the conventional spring burn, slight decrease in the August 1st burn and about a 75% a decrease in that late summer or September 1st burn in canopy frequency. We're really starting to cut into the physical presence of the plant. Okay, one of the other metrics of vigor that we use is stem height. Um, the taller a plant is, generally the more seed it's going to produce, generally the more root mass it's going to have. Um, in our, our pre-treatment phase on July 16th, stem height in the conventional spring burn is about 27 centimeters, and that drops to about 18 centimeters in both of our growing season burn treatments, but no statistical difference there. After the burns have been applied, okay, we still have the same stem height in our conventional spring burn. Stem height drops to less than seven centimeters in our midsummer and late summer burn treatments. Okay, one of the things that makes this treatment, this, this growing season fire treatment really appeal to me is that fire sees everything. Okay, where the fire passes, Ceresia will be top killed. Where the fire passes, seed production will be interrupted. Okay, you can see in the right-hand panel a very clean burn line right there. Everything to the right of that burn line is dead. Everything to the left is, is still trucking on, doing its thing. Now, human beings on a four-wheeler with a spray tank will miss Ceresia plants. Herbivores, okay, in their grazing habits will miss Ceresia plants. Fire just doesn't miss anything where it passes. Okay, a couple more key metrics of Ceresia lespedeza vigor, and we'll go to the discussion. Uh, at the end of the season, on every one of our plots we come in and we pick <clears throat> 100 whole Ceresia plants, clip them, weigh them, and then physically strip the seed off of them. Okay, in our conventional spring burn treatment, the average Ceresia plant weighs about 3,300 milligrams on a dry basis. Okay, following our midsummer burns, that dormancy, Okay, the average Ceresia plant weighs about 450 milligrams. And in our late summer treatment, the average Ceresia plant weighs about 140 milligrams. So a great decrease in vigor. Okay, but the key metric for this study, it, this is all about seed production, a very simple measure. Okay, over two years, the average Ceresia plant in a conventionally burned area produced over five, 525 seeds per individual. Okay, in a midsummer burn, that number was 27 seeds per individual. And in a late summer burn, this number is not zero, but it's very close to zero. Uh, the average Ceresia plant in that late summer burn treatment produced 0 0.7 seeds per individual. Okay, and just so you know, I'm not telling you tales. Okay, this is, these are packets of our complete seed production from each of our three spring burn patches, each of our three August 1st patches here in the center, and each of our three September 1st patches here on the far right. Okay, this is the year 2014. The contrast is pretty amazing. Okay, it wasn't just a, a year effect. Okay, in the following year, 2015, which was very wet, you can see that the seed packets look a little bit bigger and fatter for that spring burn. Uh, still greatly subdued for the August 1st burn and still almost non-existent for the September 1st burn. Now, key things to take away from this. Okay, on all of our treatments, forage biomass going into dormancy was at least 3,400 pounds of dry matter per acre. Again, comparable to what you would leave behind after an episode of intensive early stocking. Fall and winter grazing would have been certainly possible on all treatments. Uh, both our midsummer and our late summer fires reduced canopy frequency of Ceresia at dormancy. It, there's a, a strong visual effect on the site right now in that regard. Uh, our midsummer fire reduced seed production by about 20 fold, and our late summer fire just about eliminated seed production. This is what I think this stuff means. Okay, we're, we're 
straining our eyes, we're breaking our backs, we're taking an awful lot of time and spending an awful lot of money in an attempt to control Cerisia lespidiza with herbicide. And in my opinion, it's not been very successful. Prescribed burning independent of insurance costs costs us about 75 cents an acre and we're probably gonna do that intervention anyway here in the Flint Hills with fair regularity. Okay, the current cash cost of fall applied herbicide without operator labor is eight to 16 bucks an acre. Now, from a livestock production standpoint, okay, we can make this temporarily compatible with intensive early stocking by virtue of burning after those steers leave rather than before they show up. Okay, we can also make it compatible with beef cow production. And as much as there are going to be places in our inventory when beef cows are, that beef cows are not going to occupy during this interval. And we have the opportunity to apply fire then. From a stocker steer perspective, okay, effects on animal performance are unknown. We hope to address this in a future study. However, okay, the margin for treatment here is the difference between 75 cents an acre and probably 16 bucks an acre, again, exclusive of operator labor. We can probably afford to take slightly less stocker steer performance if we have $15.25 in margin per acre to play with. From a smoke management perspective, okay, we need to get smoke out of the month of April. This is a great opportunity to do so. Uh, if we are able to, uh, to take some smoke out of April and move it to the late summer, we'll probably make our, our neighbors to the north and east uh, less angry with us uh, with respect to the prescribed burn um, situation. Another thing I think bears mentioning here is labor management. Um, I don't know a single rancher that isn't strapped for time and stressed, okay, during that March, April, May time interval. They're trying to get cattle in, they're trying to get them straightened out from a health standpoint. They're also trying to get pasture burned. Okay, if we can move some of that labor commitment outside of that window, that may improve time and labor management for our clients. And folks, that's all I've got to say today. I guess I went a little bit over time. I apologize, but uh, I'd like to open it up for discussion.